Hello. I guess we're here. That was my that was my record. That was my jam. Uh, hey, this is David Magdale here with the uh, Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. I wanted to welcome you to our final Saturday series of the C3 Converse as part of the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. We are so excited. These last Saturdays, we've been doing uh, talkbacks um, at noon together with um, ADOC and then uh, uh, Open Your Eyes and Think MF. So let me go through some housekeeping. I'll read the introduction so we can get going. So welcome to the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival presented by Visual Communications. Thank you for joining us today for our C3 Converse uh, Artist Conversation in partnership with ADOC and OYEA TMF. Thank you to all of our partners who made the 36th annual Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival possible. And thank you especially to the Academy Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, Sony Pictures Entertainment, Comcast, NBC Universal, California Arts Council, SAG, After Producers Industry Advancement and Cooperate, Cooperative Fund, the National Endowment for the Arts, HBO, and Warner Media. ADOC is a filmmaker led national network of over 700 Asian Americans working in documentary. We are mainly filmmakers, both award-winning veterans and emerging, but also include programmers, writers, journalists, curators, funders that work to increase the visibility and support of Asian Americans in the documentary field. Open Your Eyes and Think MF was established by film publicist myself and my colleague Vince Johnson to support films and filmmakers that may not fit within the current distribution exhibition uh, film system. The goal is to provide access to films that are challenging and changing the landscape of truth telling and story creation. These filmmakers include BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and other content creators who are on, who are on the margins. So we wanted to establish something for us since we felt that a lot of times, you know, the ecosystem within distribution wasn't working for everybody because maybe the gatekeepers may not understand the types of films that our communities have. But today we're here to talk about the co this is the COVID Chronicles. And, you know, we look back, we are all in this pandemic, pandemic 19, COVID 19. And we wanted to talk about what are our artists doing, you know, during this time period of what, what are the filmmakers doing? ADOC put together this amazing, um, this amazing, how would you say initiative and it's a, a filmmakers who were doing films and writing and micro docs. And so we're really, really, really blessed to have two filmmakers who have two pieces that we're also showing here in the film festival. Uh, we have uh, Sarita Kurana, whose film Home Delivered, and then Kimberly Bass Bassford, whose film is Poi Dog Lessons. Both of these are part of the ASEAN COVID stories. And then our other panelists that we have is Hao Wu, whose feature film, 70, 76 Days, had its world premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival, and then has been going around through different other film festivals, including AFI Fest. Uh, we're showing it here at the LA Asian Film Festival, San Diego. You can take a look, he's, he's actually getting out the gate and it's everywhere and it's, it's amazing. It's so amazing that MTV Films picked it up or MTV Documentaries. So there'll be a big uh, push for this film coming out now. Um, so, and he continues to win awards from Heartland and AFI Fest and even Cam Fest. So watch, if you get a chance to watch his film here through the LA Asian Film Festival, please do. Our moderator today is the, is the infamous Christina Wong. I've known Christina for a long time when she started off as a performance artist, comedian. I, I looked at her as a filmmaker, performance artist, writer, director, actress, comedian, but I like to call her an artivist. She's an elected representative of the Wilshire Center Koreatown Sub District 5 Neighborhood Council. And her current pandemic project is the Auntie Sewing Squad, a national network of volunteers sewing masks for vulnerable communities. And her latest performance piece that she's pulling together is Sweatshop Overlord. Without further ado, please welcome Christina Wong. Christina, turn on your... your Hi, David. Hey, Thank you for that you? nice introduction. I used You're to welcome. crash um, 
the film festival red carpets dressed as a fake Miss Chinatown. Now you actually invite me to do events. See? Yeah, but see, look, look, how, look how we, we've grown and it's just it's so, <laughs> it's so great to be here and it's so great to look. I've known you for such a long time and I see how you've grown into this artist, but also to, you know, when the pandemic hit, you just like pivoted and said, I got to do this. I got to start yeah. putting together this national, this national thing that just exploded. So hats off to yeah. you. Yeah, I would, yeah, thank you. I would like to point out that one of the ADOC filmmakers, Valerie So, actually made a short uh, about, and I think it's, if you watched Howe's documentary, which I I'd expect you did, because that's why you're here. Um, and I'm looking at how bundled up those folks are. We were literally making masks out of old film festival lanyards and bed sheets. So that's why, our documentary in America will not be called 76 Days. It might be called 76,000 Years. But anyway, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so uh, happy to be moderating this today. Uh, again, I'm Christina Wong. I'm a performance artist. I actually tour a show called Christina Wong for Public Office, which I pivoted to touring in my house. So, so I had just removed the set because I'm gonna be filming the show at CTG next week and uh, heavy protocol for filming. So I have so many questions for these filmmakers about like, how did you shoot? At, Cause most of these were shot at the top of the pandemic. You know, what are the protocols you used? Um, I also run an on a, a, a shadow FEMA. It's our seven month anniversary today of the Auntie Sewing Squad. And it's a very bittersweet anniversary because we don't understand why we still have to do this work. While there are cheap uh, masks out on the market, we find ourselves uh, now doing things like clothing drives for Standing Rock and Navajo Nation so they can get through the winter without freezing to death. We find ourselves like locating medical equipment so that Standing Rock's um, ambulance services can have basic things like wheelchairs and things like that. But um, so this, so I, I was having a lot of reflections as I watched uh, all these documentaries. And I want to like first start by introducing Kimberly uh, Bassford, who I believe is still in Hawaii and is the filmmaker of um, poi dog lessons. Um, Kimberly, come say hi and maybe hi, just Helen. let us know who you were before COVID. <laughs> just give us a glimpse of it before you decided to make this project. Or I guess I don't know if we decided to make anything. I think that we just kind of get hit with this moment. But you want to introduce yourself a little, Kimberly? Sure. So, hi, everybody. My name is Kimberly Bassford. I'm an independent documentary filmmaker based in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, I've made documentaries uh, before, usually focusing on the stories of girls and women. Uh, but when COVID hit and I heard about ADOC's initiative, I really thought this was a great opportunity to um, contribute to the documentation of what's going on, of course, around the world, but especially in Hawaii and the communities here. And so um, I made Poi Dog Lessons, um, which I can probably talk about a little bit later. But we'll talk it, about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a great experience. And it's just a really wonderful being here on this panel with these other wonderful filmmakers who I admire. Yes, awesome. And I'm going to introduce Sarita Karana, who, uh, whose film is Home Delivered. Who I believe, are you still in New York right now? Hi everyone, yep, yes. I'm still in New York, in Brooklyn, USA. Um, great to be here. Yeah, and as Kimberly said, um, the ADOC initiative was so great just because it brought a lot of us uh, together to sort of really talk about what was happening in Asian American country, uh, communities across the country. Um, I've been making docs for the last 20 years, so it's just great to be here today. Yeah, thank you for your work. Okay, cool. So Hao Wu uh, made the amazing 76 days. I have so many questions about how you how did you, how do you stumble into a hospital with active COVID and a camera? Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit, tell us where you are now and what you were just sort of working on before the lockdown happened that landed you in a, in Wuhan in a hospital. <laughs> Actually, I, I was never in, in, inside of Wuhan. But hi everyone, my name is Ha Wu. I'm the uh, director producer of, of 76 Days. So I've been making documentary films full time for 10 years now. My last feature was called People's Republic Desire about live streaming stars in China. And then after that, I made a Netflix original doc short called Only My Family about my process of having kids to a surrogacy and taking them back to face my conservative family uh, who still live in China. So 76 days kind of happened, um, you know, by accident. Um, I was in China during Chinese New Year when the lockdown happened, visiting my family in Shanghai. 
And then it was just a, such a bizarre experience. Even though Shanghai was still pretty far from Wuhan, Shanghai is China's largest city with 21 million people. But as soon as Wuhan was put under lockdown, the entire country of China voluntarily shut down during the biggest family holiday. And then just walking around in, in, in Shanghai during the, and everybody stay in their apartment, just scrolling on their phone, trying to find out what, what, what the hell was happening. So it was a really eerie experience. And it kind of made the story more personal to me because in the past, I usually shy away from making very newsy topic documentaries. I like to do character human centric stories. But uh, in February, early February, as soon as I came back to the US, when the US network asked me if I wanted to make a film about coronavirus that wasn't the COVID-19 pandemic yet, I jumped down. Even though later on, this project fell through, I still you know, continue with it, reaching out to filmmakers um, who had been filming on the ground in Wuhan. I talked to over a dozen of them before I found my two co-directors. Okay, so this is, this is all news to me. And uh, <laughs> I was like, whoa, like, did you like fly from New York and like, I'm let me in. I'm gonna. <laughs> so, so um, uh, you you were just sort of calling around, like who who can get inside a hospital or how? how yeah. Does that so work? just calling people around, just say who know. Do you know anyone who's filming in Wuhan? It's a small com. I mean, relatively documentary um, industry in China, especially independent. Uh, film filmmaking community is quite small. So by talking to people, you quickly understand who who's where during this pandemic, during the lockdown. So I, I asked for introductions. I never met any of the people over a dozen filmmakers I met. But then people kind of have this trust because you know if you were introduced, referred by someone they know, and and then. The way I collaborated with my uh, two co-directors, they will first upload the footage onto the cloud. Thank goodness they were not shooting 4K. They were only shooting HD. So uploading to the cloud service didn't take that long. And then I would download the footage in New York uh, through the Great Firewall and look at the footage and have discussion with them. But uh, mostly I think they were just making decisions, filming decisions on the ground. And I play a much bigger role later on when I try to assemble the footage together because my two co-directors were filming independently. They didn't know each other. And one filmmaker was in Wuhan and one was in Shanghai. Is that right? No, there were two different uh, hospitals. So or, there, or... No, 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 there's actually four different hospitals in Wuhan only. I mean, there's a, there, I need to make some change to the film because the lower third about Shanghai, that's where uh -huh. the doctor came from. That's the, where the nurse came from. Now, oh, so the, it's all Wuhan. It's not. It's all it's, Wuhan. Four okay, different hospitals okay. in Wuhan. Yeah, yeah. But I did okay. make a plan to smuggle myself all the way from New York back into Wuhan. I mean, all the plan is like a human sm uh, smuggling. But then, in March, it was very obvious the coronavirus was coming to New York, and so we made it. I made it, We made the decision. I'm gonna stay in New York and started filming. I actually filmed a little bit in New York, but then later on decided not to use that. Uh, inside of the film because and fo focus the, the film exclusively on, on Wuhan. Your jaw just must have dropped watching that cloud footage because like the first scene is a woman crying. Do you remember what the first thing was when you like that that really was like holy crap or yeah I mean, that's, it just seems that's like actually, a constant like yeah <laughs> that, that was one of the first uh, first scene I watched when I downloaded the, the footage I and mean, that's one of the scene that my co-director highlighted so I watched that scene I think um in late February as soon as I watched it I was like this is definitely gonna go into the film because it's just so raw and so emotional that 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 just keep, brings you right there in the center of the pandemic because I think I was in New York uh, you know, I've been in the U.S. since the beginning of February. A lot of times when we hear about COVID, it's about numbers, right? It's about how to wear a mask or not to wear a mask. Or what, what is the political implication of that? Very rarely do we actually see, at least get a visual experience of what's it like inside of the hospitals. Uh, even though the like CNN, NBC, they have uh, short clips, short visual clips, uh, video clips about inside the hospital. I don't think we have been exposed enough. So as soon as I saw those footage, I know that's the footage I'm gonna use to make a film. And it made me, it was like very clear as I was watching it. I was like, I have not actually ever been inside a hospital in China. I only went to China once, but and thankfully didn't have to go to the hospital. But I was like, oh, that's what inside of a hospital in China looks like. And, and that's yeah. the sort of humor, like the blown up gloves. I mean, it's not, that wasn't a joke necessarily. It was like really um, handy, right? To use a blown up glove to help hold, hold up these tubes, but also, you know, draw well-wish messages on 
uh, their backs yeah. and stuff like that and the way they comfort each other and res and the, sort of the respect even so someone's not your grandmother you still refer them as your grandmother i was yeah. i was just yeah and i was just like i i think that's what a, a america needs to see this because we haven't seen the inside of an American hospital, but I think it needs to hit us how real this is. And it's not for a lot of folks. I want to take it to um, Sarita and Kimberly. How, what was your connection to your subjects that that had you go, all right, this is what I'm filming. You already had a relationship. I know Kimberly, you're a fan of um, Honolulu Theater for Youth. Um, yeah, so I was a fan of Honolulu Theater for Youth. And during the pandemic, they sort of pivoted because they're a theater group and they do live performances, um, particularly with families and children. And of course, they couldn't do that anymore. So they had the wonderful idea to create a digital series. So they were pivoting and I just happened to uh, watch one of their, their episodes. And it was just amazing because um, you know, they were they were interspersing with the information, just things about that were so unique to Hawaii, and they were really gearing it toward families and kids. And I think that's, you know, an important thing, because this is a really scary time. I have kids mm -hmm. myself, which is another reason why I was watching it. And so when I got the um, heard about the ADOC initiative, I thought, you know, it'd be great to do a story about something about the theater. Um, and, and so I sort of was looking at it broadly. And then when I found the Poi Dog lessons, the Poi Dog piece, um, that I've decided to focus on that because it was really sort of a metaphor of what I really wanted to say during the pandemic, which, you know, this was sort of early on um, when I was pitching it to ADOC. And this is, you know, when, I mean, it's still going on, but a lot of the, um, the, the prejudice was happening around the country. And I thought it'd be great to sort of focus on, you know, we need to embrace, you know, our cultural diversity and, and things like that. And I think we do that pretty well here in Hawaii, although we're not perfect, but Poi Dog, the piece really sort of encapsulated that. And so that's sort of why I ended up focusing on that. But I hadn't met Makiila Ishihara, who is the subject of the film. Um, until then, you know, I decided I wanted to, I, had, I actually reached out to Honolulu Theater for Youth and I said, I'm interested in pitching the story to ADOC. Um, and so the relationship built from there. I didn't actually have a formal relationship ahead of, ahead of time. I was just a fan of their work. So uh, how did you shoot remotely in a way that was, how did you yeah. shoot her? Yeah, so I mean, it's, I was a little bit fortunate. I filmed it in late June. And so in Hawaii, uh, the cases were pretty low for quite a while. And we had our first wave sort of mid July. It was sort of after 4th of July. So, I mean, things were locked down but the cases actually weren't that high. So I just did everything myself and I, uh, I wore a mask and I went into the theater and it was just me and Mickey Ile um, in this large theater, right? So we were able to socially distance and and I mean, if it wasn't the pandemic, I would have probably brought on a cinematographer and all of that. I just decided to keep things really tight and really simple. So many buttons. Sarita, <laughs> how did you stumble upon, um, this is an organization that works with uh, South Asian seniors, is that right? Or was this yeah. an initiative that came up out of this? Like, was, were they always just offering food to seniors and especially now? Yeah, the organization um, is India Home and they're based throughout Queens. And at that point, you know, Queens was all over the news uh, being dubbed the epicenter of the epicenter. And I had already been in conversation with India Home because I'd been researching a longer project about immigrant seniors in the US. And this is an organization that works specifically with South Asian seniors in Queens. And so um what they were providing meals just at their centers like when people would come in and you know do some activities and have a meal but the whole home delivered meal thing was brand new once the pandemic hit and people were really isolated and quarantined at home so for me it was really just wanting to give you know a voice both to you know seniors which is one of the most vulnerable populations at this point and really you know, they weren't going home, they're kind of feeling just locked down at home more so than so many people. Um, and then also those essential workers, you know, in in the restaurants and the kitchens who were delivering food to these seniors. So I, I, I had been in conversation with India Home and reached out to them when ADOC um, was commissioning films for this series. And that story just really made sense to me to kind of highlight during the pandemic in terms of, you know, what communities were doing to actually, you know, help each other and provide some mutual aid. 
I definitely feel like this is such a moment where care is this commodity. Like we cannot buy our way out of this problem. We can't keep throwing the money at COVID because the vaccine will come. Like it doesn't motivate anyone to make it come faster. Clearly, we haven't thrown money at it. But like it is so valuable when folks show up. I know this is someone who's like tirelessly sewing, and someone would show up with a pizza. And and that's not. I'm not food insecure, but it was just very useful to feel like I was being remembered and not taken for granted. How much footage did you collect? Because both of you did this in two minutes. I, I can't, Sarita, I imagine you had a lot because you had a lot of- It's also of funny <laughs> the amount you shoot just to, you know, even for a two minute piece. Like I, I think I had like 12 or 14 hours, which in proportion, you know, it's, it's not a ton, right? To edit with, but in proportion to what you end up making so much gets left out. And for me, that was a couple of things. Like I did a lot of Zoom interviews with the seniors. Um, and so, you know, maybe there was like eight or nine of those. And then we we did film for a full day in Queens with the, you know, the food delivery and the restaurant and going to different seniors houses, um, you know, and that was a full day of, you know, maybe eight hours of footage. And I, um, so yeah, even in the scheme of things, like having 14 hours for a two minute piece, you leave a mm -hmm. lot out and it's so hard to edit uh, down to two minutes, yeah. uh, painful almost, but yeah. Yeah. Was, I was um, like, uh, I was like counting all the exposure you were doing. I was like, okay, you're in a restaurant. Okay. That's outside a senior's home. You definitely got into a vehicle at some point. Uh, <laughs> so, and this was like in April, right? This is right at the height of yeah. The outbreak. So, was, so what I were the, is sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, what? So, so I'm just wondering what kind of precautions you took in terms of like, okay, I'll shoot a field piece in the middle of the pandemic. Like, uh, yeah, I think how that, you approach you know, that. That was that was a choice in sort of many stages of actually deciding to do that. And I was, I worked with a friend and colleague, Amber Ferris, who lives in my neighborhood, and so we had been you know, socially distantly seeing each other and she's a DP and um, she was down to, you know, do this with me, but it was, you know, it's never just a conversation between you, right? Like you talk to the people in your household, your partners, you have to speak to uh, the people you're gonna go meet at the restaurant at Halal Diner. And, you know, the mm -hmm. seniors, we wanted to be really clear with them that, you know, it's outside, you know, just when you're outside of your house, there's going to be no contact. But, you know, Amber and I really had to talk through, like, what did that look like? Because she did end up getting in that vehicle with the, you know, mm -hmm. Jewel and Muhammad who were driving the car. And um, yeah, it's masks, it's uh, keeping as much distance as possible. And, you know, you carrying around a lot of hand sanitizer and yeah you know waiting two weeks after that and being like we're okay yeah we, we did okay yeah yeah congrats on getting all that footage and how i guess you had the biggest hack is that you just found people on the ground to, <laughs> to do it and you could direct from your yeah computer. just remotely but i did <laughs> in new york when the pandemic hit new york so my partner uh, actually took uh, our kids uh, he drove down to Atlanta to stay at my in-laws place. So that's how I could get in, in and out on a daily basis. I was filming, just filming a homeless shelter uh, on the subway. I actually went mm -hmm. inside people's home in, in the Bronx uh, because at the very beginning, some of the senior, and also in the senior retirement building, some of them were taking good care of themselves, other, others weren't. So yeah, it, it was a daily debate uh, because especially at the very beginning, we didn't know how dangerous the virus is, right? Every day yeah. in the media, the numbers keep on changing, the mortality, whatever the um, are, are not uh, numbers, they keep on changing. So, so yeah, hand sanitizer, masks, um, I would take uh, I would take off all my uh, clothes as soon as I get in and jump into shower. But now looking back, it feels like a lifetime ago. It feels so a little bit bizarre because just at the beginning, because everybody was so afraid of this, right? It was a lifetime ago. I used to have bangs. <laughs> I don't have bangs anymore. So it was a lifetime ago. Um, yeah, let's talk about the editing process. So how can you talk about like Sarita just described 14 hours that came down to two minutes. How, how much footage did you go through and what, what was your decision making process? Because I do feel like it does. Because I was just like, how is this going to end? Because we're actually still in this. I'm like, this is not a this is not a rom com where it's happy ever after. But it does end with a baby yeah. uh, that goes off to the baby's home and um, an old man 
yeah. who I think is the closest thing to an American anti-masker personality, <laughs> but he's he's just an old Chinese man with dementia. Like, yeah. in the, so I'm just like, what is wrong with us? Why are we all acting like a Chinese man with dementia? But um, I don't know if that. <laughs> I love that lie. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody. But uh, yeah. <laughs> but what like I you know I was just sort of watching like. I don't know how this is going to end because we're, this is so crazy, folks. I just have to say this. We're watching something about the crisis we're still in. We're yeah. not, <laughs> this is nuts. Anyway, how, so um, can you tell me when you you uh, put a pin in it and said, uh, you know, the film is ready to go and what that, and that edi editing process of deciding what, what stays and what goes? Yeah, so and I'll, I'll ask the, the same of the, both of you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah ahead, so, Hal. so in the beginning, uh, it was really hard to know what what the film is uh, is about because uh, when I started editing, obviously there's different ways, right? I was filming in New York. We could do a story of two cities, a tale of two cities, how Wuhan, and New York responded to the virus. Uh, that was my intention, but then I couldn't get inside the hospitals here, uh, despite the government censorship control in China. There's always way to get inside here in the U.S. Uh, the hospital, you know, because of HIPAA, because of the way uh, how um, healthcare bureaucracy works, it was really hard for me to get in. Um, so, so. But then still, whether I'm telling uh, 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 recounting of exactly what happened during the 76 of, uh, um, uh, of lockdown, including the case numbers, how the case number went up and came down, how the politics changed locally, how, um, how social media reacted to it. Uh, and in the beginning, I, I thought making this really, really big, uh, so I got almost an official history of the lockdown. So I, I asked my co-director actually went outside of the hospital and filmed more people outside of the hospital as well. But then in late March, because the geo, uh, fingerprint and geo, um, geopolitical fighting between China and the US, um, because the, uh, President Trump was saying this is a China virus and anti-Asian racism is going up in this, what's going up in this country. And, and China, the Chinese government tightened its control over any COVID narrative coming out of China as well. So my two co-directors basically said, we can't work with you. You are in New York, you are independent, you, you don't work in China. We don't know where you're gonna take this film. So what I, you know, I, for, for a period of time, I was really depressed. I was like, I have no film, um, made a lot of personal sacrifice, ended up with nothing. So what I did was, because they shared the footage with me already, so I just really just dive into the footage and try to give myself say, maybe in a month or so, see if you can edit out a rough cut of a film and maybe show it to them. If they agree to give you legal authorization to use their footage, then you can continue to work on this film. So that's why I really rushed through the editing process. So I just grabbed all the image, all the scenes that resonated with me emotionally very strongly when I look at it first time doing February or, or March, and I edit out those scenes, strong emotional scenes, and just try to string them together. So once I had those scenes, I made a decision, like, first of all, I'm not gonna take uh, use any of the news archival clips, none of the social, you know, uh, social media clips, because I feel like the scenes I, I, I can string together, that's so powerful. Why not let the viewer just stay inside the hospital as much as possible to, for, for firsthand experience, rather than having any news clip or any outside information trying to educate the viewers what they're supposed to take away from, from the scenes. And then I think in early April, after the National Morning Day, which is currently at the end of the 76 days, I saw a social media video about how residents in Wuhan moon together doing the air siren blaring all over the city. I remember I was bawling in front of my computer in New York. I was crying because it was just so stressful trying to understand what's happening. I feel so disconnected from everybody. Um, you know, I have a family in China. My, my own family is in, in Atlanta with my in-law. I was all alone in New York trying to film and not sure whether I have a film. So I was, I was really emotionally, uh, I, I, you know, res emotionally responded to that. So then at that time I said, that's the end of the film. That's the emotional end of my film. So, so that kind of gave me a container for the film. So from the start of the lockdown to the end of the lockdown, 76 days. So as soon as I, I, I reached that decision, I pretty much had a very clear roadmap how to get my film done. I, I, I was just like, how did you get all this footage out of China? Like I always would think that they, I don't know. Are there... It's cloud, the magic of cloud. It's just cloud, yeah. yeah. So I guess they can't come after you and be like, don't, this footage was supposed I, to just I don't, live I don't, in the air. 
I, like, I oh. think the sensors they haven't figured out the AI technology to decide <laughs> which image is subversive. Yeah. So you know, I mean, recently I I had another filmmaker try to ship me a drive, physical drive of yeah. another film, that and it work, got stopped right? by the custom and yeah. it got confiscated. The yeah. cloud. Okay, so we can yeah. uh, the cloud is how we get around. Yeah. Communist censorship. All right. Excellent. So. <laughs> I learned something. I hope we all learned something. Serena, so what so what happens with all this extra footage? Mm, you know, you talked question. about maybe a longer project, but but what else is brewing with that? Yeah, footage? I mean, I'd love off? to um, continue filming with this organization, India Home, especially because so many of the seniors talked about the day they could possibly return and to these centers and see one another. But I think, you know, the a uh, story of, you know, how our, you know, elderly fare in this pandemic is going to be an ongoing one. So I, I definitely could imagine continuing to film some of their journeys. And I am working on a longer piece about, you know, how South Asians are aging in this country. So maybe some of those folks will end up in that longer documentary. Um, I just wanted to say to how, like when I watched his film, you know, it really reminded me of like Frederick Weissman's uh, hospital and Ramona Diaz's motherland. And motherland. I thought it was so great that you, yeah. you know, I know we were talking earlier on the call, like how, how hard it is to film people who are wearing masks. And then in your film, not just masks, but full on suits, you know, and, and how, do you, how do you choose to, you know, really have those emotional stories because you can't see anybody much behind their mask, right? Like, but yeah. still your film had this incredible, like emotional resonance. And, you know, I thought that was really incredible that you were able to do that. When you can't see anybody, you don't know what they're thinking. Everyone kind of looks the same because they're all suited up. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, thank, it was- thank, thank you for bringing up Wiseman and uh, R Ramona because for a while I, as a, I used to do like, a, documentary with some main characters going through some hero's journeys with a rough act structure, almost like a narrative film, right? But then with this one, obviously when my co-director were filming in the hospital, it was absolute chaos. It was really hard to see who might be the main character to, you know, to film more. It's really hard to tell. So, so when I was trying to construct this film in doing editing, I was like, I don't have any main characters. And also my co-directors were not talking to me at that time. I couldn't ask them to go back and do pick up interviews with, with, with the characters e either. So I was faced, I, I could only work with the footage I downloaded off the cloud. And then, you know, that's when I remember Romana Diaz and Frederick Weissman, I went back to watch their film. I got the inspiration that, wait, I don't have to explain everybody. I don't have to explain all the detail, all the background information, all the characters' backstories to the audience. I can just let the audience watch it um, by themselves and draw a conclusion by themselves. So that's one huge inspiration once I revisited Motherland, uh, Frederick Weissman's films, and also like uh, Kirsten Johnson's The Camera Person as well. Um, but then doing editing, I guess I just follow my emotional instinct because I pick certain characters because the, their stories fits an emotional beat. Like the old grandpa is dementia, wants to go home. And the couple want to get reunited as a family with their baby. And then the nerd, female nurse Yang Li is like almost obsessed with collecting the phones of the dead and returning them to their relatives, right? So everybody has this one beat. So I, I feel like I, you know, as long as I stay with the beat of uh, the emotional beat of this character, audience will be able to tell them apart, even though you cannot tell them apart physically. Oh, so I have a question for everyone. I'll start with Kimberly. So what is like one thing that emotionally surprised you or that you like in the process of making this that you like left with this something new that you didn't have before? And, and that could also be the crisis talking to us, right? Like we were having a lot of time to reflect we're not just phoning in our old work the way we used to do it. We're definitely learning things about ourselves. What are you, what, what's something that you've picked up in this process of making your project? Mm, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Well, you know, I think for this film, because it was a two minute, a two minute film, um, which I've never done a two minute film before. Um, I just, I really sort of had to like I said before, sort of keep it really simple, keep it tight, 
and that you can tell a story in, in two minutes, I think is also something that's great. I mean, I've always loved short films, but and these are like micro documentaries, which was totally new to me. Um, and um, for me, like I didn't have as much of the challenge that the others had with production because I was really just focused on this one character and I knew I was going to use the, the theater's piece itself in the film. So I, didn't, I knew I didn't, was going to need a lot of volume of footage, but the editing was actually still challenging um, in terms of just, you know, boiling it all down and, um, and also making sure it translated to an audience beyond, beyond Hawaii. Um, Cause you know, the, the, the phrase poi dog is not something that people outside of Hawaii would know about. Um, but the idea of just, yeah, just like, I think, I think that's something I'll take with me is, you know, always kind of going back to like, what is the main purpose of this film and just keeping things, things simple. And the fact, I think I actually gained confidence too, cause I did the whole film by myself, which I don't normally do. Um, usually like, like I work with, with an editor and a, a cinematographer and whatnot, but I edited it and I shot it. And so actually that was sort of a boost for me um, to feel like I can do this all on my own. But I don't necessarily want to moving forward, but that I could. <laughs> A lot of us are doing things we don't want to do right now, but we have to do it. I didn't want to run a sweatshop. Here I am. Um, Sarita, I imagine you're learning a lot about generosity and aging and care. Can you share with us like something you've left with in this process of making, observing, filming this? Yeah, I mean, when you asked, uh, you know, Kimberly that question, I just started thinking about definitely this idea of doing collective work. And that kind of happened on, two ends, it was both with ADOC who commissioned the series. And I think, you know, definitely to document like what was happening in Asian American communities, but also as a response to all the anti-Asian racism that was happening. And, and just working in that kind of collective was uh, really remarkable because there was, you know, the films were also talking to one another in the series and sort of presenting this this larger picture of, of what's happening in our communities. And, and then just that there was so much support around, you know, funding and distribution, which filmmakers, you know, all, all those pieces don't necessarily happen together, right? Like you might make the film, but there is no distribution or you don't have any money, but you have this idea. So I think that kind of collective work, and then certainly around what India Home was doing. And I think what surprised me is, you know, my film ended on this really like positive note. And I didn't necessarily see that coming. Like when I when I was editing, like that there was going to be something so hopeful at the end of it. But it was about, you know, communities coming together and sort of figuring out like on the ground ways of how to support one another and, um, you know, providing that care that you're talking about. So I think that you know, whole thing of like, this is what we're making for ourselves. This is what we're doing for ourselves. This is the way we're finding ways to show up for each other really surprised me. Yeah. Beautiful. So how, uh, before we ask you what you learned when someone has a nuts and bolts question, which is how you get into a hospital, which is my question too. How does yeah. someone with a, with a camera and <laughs> which is a potential liability in a time when a hospital is in such chaos get in and get to, and get to stick their fit camera so close to people yeah i, I think it, it was uh it, it was not easy i think during the lockdown china um definitely there was uh, restrictions on access to hospital only medical professionals patients as and reporters slash government sanctioned TV crews were allowed inside of hospitals. Um, but then this type of control was not uniformly applied across, because Wuhan is a big city of 11 million people. There are many hospitals. Not every hospital uh, is um, you know, that strict. Um, and uh, also in the beginning of the lockdown, when it was absolutely chaos, when hospitals were overwhelmed and needed a lot of donations from this, from everybody uh, elsewhere in China. Uh, they welcome anybody with a reporter's badge to come in and report what's going on, on the front line and, and to raise awareness. So, um, so with my two co-directors, the uh, one of them was working a video reporter working for Esquire China. Uh, so Esquire China is a very commercial publication, and he wasn't sent by the publication to go reporting on the lockdown. He just went there by himself because he felt he would feel compelled to to understand what's happening on the front line. So he embedded himself with a medical team 
was that was being sent from elsewhere in China into Wuhan. So he embedded himself with that medical team. Does that mean and he dressed up like them? He's dressed that's like absolutely. a- Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he oh, first wow. got an agreement from the medical team say, can I film you? And then so the medical team carried him along, not carry him, uh, brought him along on the airplane to arrive in Wuhan. Uh, and then they talked to the hospital chief. The hospital chief said, oh, you know, medical team brought them along. So maybe the, he was there doing propaganda work. Nobody knew uh, because at the beginning it was all chaos. Uh, oh, you, you came with the medical team, you, of course you can film. So, and, and, and then at that time, because a lot of them want, also wanted somebody to document, like for example, in the film, right? Uh, some of the nurse, they volunteer to go to Wuhan to support because they have this hero stream. They want to be able to help people on the front line. So they want somebody to be, to be there helping them document their experiences. And with my other co-director Anonymous, he's a local photojournalist working for a local state-owned publication. So he was sent there to take pictures, but then he felt like um, he needed to do videos because photos alone could not just capture the intensity of, of, of the outbreak. Um, but then he still, you know, uh, he's still afraid of any potential uh, political backlash against him or even internet trolls in China accusing him of taking advantage of the tragedy there. So that's why he's remaining anonymous. But overall, it's like, yeah, there, there was tight control, but then because it's chaotic, because it's big. So it depends on how you negotiate with the, with the people. It, it's ruled by people, right? If you can convince the, the, the person who's making the decision that, the, you know, it's okay, you know, we're not gonna, um, and if that person's feeling comfortable, you can go inside and feel. Uh, and I was dying to ask this question because I thought you were the actual one in the hospital, but I think you saw enough of the footage that you can tell us. If you have like a minute to share with everybody like how this changed you and, and like a message for America about what what you witnessed about how Wuhan has dealt with this versus how we've dealt with it. Like what is your like one minute message? I know you made it in a whole feature, but yeah, <laughs> we, only, we only have a few minutes I, I, I don't know, like when I was in Shanghai at the end of January, I, I was almost like an anti-masker. My parents were like, don't go outside. I, I would go outside and taking photo, taking video all over Shanghai. I couldn't believe it was real because it, it feels so far away. Um, but then as soon as I started working on this film and seeing the footage, and I guess the first message is that take this seriously. It is you know, it's, it can destroy individuals and destroy families. You don't want anyone you love um, get infected by this virus. Uh, but strangely in this country, somehow with our superior healthcare system uh, and scientific research uh, system, we still, you know, a lot of a big a pub, a portion of the population still refuse to believe in science. And secondly, I think one thing that changed me is that to see how people help each other on the front line, even though everybody was alone, overwhelmed, uh, overwhelmed but then people still reach out to help each other. Um, that really resonated with me because when I was living in New York, every night at seven o'clock, everybody banned the pants and pots and cheer for the medical workers. Uh, I, I, when I was talking to filmmakers in Milan every day, right? At 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., I forgot. And, you know, there will be serenade and there will be opera singings all over Italy. And in Madrid, I, I talked to filmmakers who were filming volunteers trying to deliver grocery to old people who were, you know, locked inside the residences. So I feel like, you know, despite everything, I feel like there's still hope for us as humanity, as long as we're willing to reach out to help each other. And, and that's the most important thing, just stop the squabbling, just like, let's get through this first, and then let's have discussion about politics, politics later. I definitely feel that as someone who has sort of survived this by giving so, generos so generously in a mask making group and just giving hundreds of thousands of masks to people I've never met has helped sort of preserve my, the other polar opposite instinct, which I think would be to, to hurt everybody and, and go run up the freeway with a shopping cart and my belongings and fighting people with a lead pipe. Anyway, yeah. so um, Kimberly and Sarita and how I'm gonna have one last question and then we'll take it to the end if there's no more if there are no more questions. And that is like, what are you thinking? We don't, I think the sequel to this, to 76 Days is 76 Years, which is the US version of this BPW. But anyway, what, what are you dreaming of uh, in your creative process about 
making it next. I know how you are definitely getting this film out in the market, but if you if this time is making you percolate on what's next, that we got so, sort of an idea of Sarita maybe imagining a longer piece, but Kimberly, do you have a, a sense of what you're dreaming up next in this time of isolation and reflection? Well, I'm, I'm working on a couple of feature docs in the middle of all of this, and I have been be before the pandemic, so I'm continuing to work on, on them as well. And, um, you know, doing a lot of things remotely, um, not being able to go out on shoots. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just continuing to work, but I've, you know, in terms of what I did with Poi Dog Lessons, I draw a lot of inspiration from just being with this, you know, being with Maki'i Lei and, and seeing what the Holo Theater for Youth have done. I mean, their pivot toward this digital series is amazing. It's, it's honestly really like Sesame Street for, for, for kids here. Um, and just the creativity, it's so, they're so creative. I mean, Poi Dog Lesson, they had the animation or the hand-drawn sort of animation. And that was something they hadn't really experimented with before. And so I draw inspiration from them as I move forward with my projects of like, you know, figuring out ways to be creative and resourceful um, and to just continue moving forward and using art as a way to um, express, you know, these things that we're feeling um, during this time. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just moving forward with my other projects as well. I'm not sure in terms of Poi Dog Lessons, I hope to just kind of, it's already out in the world. I just hope people will see it and take away the positive message that it has. Sarita, anything? This, how are you gonna spend the rest of the pandemic or our lives depending on how we deal with this? <laughs> Um, I mean, I was I was working on a project where I'm waiting to film in Florida, and that's not that's just not going to happen anytime soon. So, um, you know, I think this time now it's it, I've been doing a lot of research and development, having a lot of Zoom conversations. I think in parallel, there's so much happening in the doc industry around the equity inclusion. Um, and diversity conversation that both the pandemic and you know the Black Lives Matter movement have brought to the forefront. You know, and people are really grappling with you know how do you make this industry equitable and how do we keep putting out stories that are made by us and supported by us and who's behind the camera in front of the camera. So you know, I've been having a lot of those conversations in parallel to figuring out how I'm going to keep filming. I don't. Think it's still safe to have a big production you know and go out there so it's really about you know kind of like Kimberly was saying is like how can you be creative in this moment and kind of do some other things and yeah so I am I am hoping we get through this and we can all go out and keep making our work but yeah I don't know I think I'll stick to those zoom mostly zoom interviews from now <laughs> like we'll see how, what do you, are you yeah. do you have energy so, to think about more you're working on? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I love editing. I love making films. I, I, I really actually don't like talking about films as much as like making films. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm waiting to receive the footage from a filmmaker who actually started filming in China as well. I love this kind because right now in China, it has kind of come, gone back to normal. You can travel freely within the country. You can do, um, all sorts of work. It's it's unfathomable living here in America to think they can they can go back to normal. Um, but I'm waiting to, to to have the footage. Unfortunately, the filmmaker is shot in 4K, so I cannot rely on him upload the 4, 4K footage on, onto the cloud and download it. So I'm trying to figure out a way and to get the footage here, so I can start looking through the footage, start editing and putting the film together, have more discussions with it. I'm also doing some. A screenwriting and just to set up some narrative projects going as well with my new I had some new ideas about doing documentary but like uh, Sarita has said it's so hard to actually to do any research kind of filming to even meet the characters and to get a feel as a director whether the character is the right character or not so waiting for waiting for that magic vaccine to appear as President Trump has promised us and uh, so we can all start you know traveling again well, I want to thank you so much. I learned so much about your process. Thank you so much for your work. Um, good luck to us all. I think you've all made great work that really just gives us a slice of life in, in the communities we're in. And uh, here's David Magdale to close us out. How'd I do, David? Not bad for someone who used to crash the festival, huh? And you're muted. You're muted. Boom. Sorry about that. <laughs> I am muted. No, this was really great. I think, you know, seeing this panel 
and hearing from all of you who are have made films in this process and the way we're looking at things. I was just talking to a colleague of mine, like, when do we think this is going to lift? And I, in person, I don't think it's going to lift anytime soon. I know I'm not comfortable going out anywhere. You know, we're looking, oh, are we going to go to Sundance? Um, I'll be doing Sundance from home, from Zoom. Um, so I think, you know, things have changed. But I, what I love is the fact that all of you who are filmmakers and creators and have all decided to pivot and I hate that word, but that's that's the key word in 2020 and are just doing your work. I think the other thing that we wanna make sure, especially from the film festival standpoint and all of us that are in the community, we just need to help you guys keep telling our stories. You are our storytellers. We need to make sure you guys have the resources and the opportunities. So whatever we can do as visual communications, whatever we can do as the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival, ADOC, Open Your Eyes and Think MF, we are here for all of you and people who are in the audience understand that. And if there are filmmakers that are out there in the audience just kind of waiting, don't wait. People want to hear your stories, you know, like right now. And we have an opportunity and we can do this. I mean, yes, it's tough because we're in pandemic, but I see a lot of people, you know, figuring it out and making it, making it work. And with that, the film festival is still rolling forward. We end next weekend, but tomorrow, we're, you were talking about Ramona Diaz. So tomorrow we're doing an amazing talk back with her and Maria Reza, who is Time Magazine's uh, person of the year, who's been, oh, arrested numerous times by the president of the Philippines, Duterte. And so she's gonna come and talk about that. So, you know, Ramona has a film called A Thousand Cuts. So tomorrow the topic is journalism, filmmaking, and the uh, death of free press, freedom of the press by a thousand cuts. They'll be in conversation with Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, filmmaker, journalist, uh, Jose Antonio Vargas. That'll be at five o'clock on the PT side. It's free. It's uh, also in the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival uh, section. So you can click on there and RSVP. And for all of you in the documentary world, we still have got some documentaries that are playing this week um, that I encourage you to tune into. The Donut King is amazing. Uh, Far East, Deep South, Curtain Up. They're still going to be playing all the way through, I think, to the end of the week. And then um, I don't know if you guys know Richard Louie from MSNBC, CNN. So he's making his first uh, attempt at uh, filmmaking. And he's got a very uh, timely film called Sky Blossom. And we're going to have like this sneak peek kind of world premiere and it's about millennial caregivers uh in the 2020 um so that'll be happening this week as well and then we're doing talkbacks with each one of those so just check your local listings on the la asian pacific film festival and i just want to say thank you guys to each one of you guys who are making these movies and making us proud as a community you know and i was saying to christina earlier i've been working directly with uh, vc since like 1997 when linda mabalit was you know here and this has always been our dream, you know, as an old school, they, what do they call me, an elder now? Um, this is what we've been waiting for. You know, this moment we will have a collective, a, an assortment of different ideas and faces and genders and, and everything, uh, every, people can just tell their stories, whether it be documentary or whether it be narrative or, you know, animation. You know, this is the time. So we just want to encourage everybody to be to be out there. And to the people that came in and sat with us uh, in the audience, thank you for showing up today. It's really important that you guys that we want to say thank you to you for just giving us of your time. So with that, we're going to say goodbye. And thanks a lot. And you guys have a wonderful Saturday. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow at the uh, talk back with Ramona, Maria and um, Jose. All right. And remember to vote. Vote, oh, vote, yes. vote, 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 vote. vote early. I'm going across the street to the Staples Center right now to drop off my ballot. So now I know where you live. Yes, you do. You can, <laughs> oh, you can always find me ninth and flower. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right, thank, thank you. you. It's been fun. Okay, bye, everyone. Okay, so good bye -bye. to talk to you.